the bottom left hand corner of the toolbar. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is uh, two o'clock and time to start the meeting. Item one on the agenda, declaration of interest. Do we have any declaration of interest? And so can you enter in the chat box? Thank you, there are no declarations of interest. Item two on the agenda is urgent business and nothing has been brought to my attention. So we come to item three, apologies for absence. Mrs Ridge, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, we've got apologies from Councillor Howarth, who's actually speaking as a ward councillor on one of the applications today. And so Councillor Morris is deputising for her for the whole of the meeting. And we've got apologies from Councillor Wilkinson and Councillor Newall is deputising. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for the benefit of visitors, uh, can I now make one or two uh, introductions? I'm John Walsh. I'm chairman of the planning committee for this municipal year. And Sir Ayub is the Vice Chair. We also have with us today Alex Allen, the Development Manager, Gemma Hamer from the Legal Department and uh, Vicky Reid from Democratic Services. In attendance also is Jodie Turton, the Planning Officer and Graham Langley Highways Officer, who will deal with questions on specific points uh, on, as we come to the agenda. Item four is the minutes of the previous meeting. These have been circulated. Are members happy that uh, they're a correct record? If you disagree, please let me know through the chat box. Thank you. They have been moved and seconded. No disagreement. Thank you. We come then to item five, which is reports from the director of place. The process uh, for this part of the meeting, the important part of the meeting, is that uh, officers will present the report. We will then invite ward councillors to speak for up to five minutes. Following that, the objector can speak, an objector can speak for up to three minutes and be asked, to take, be asked to take questions from members of the committee. Following that, the a, a supporter will speak, be invited to speak for up to three minutes and get, take questions. Members will then be able to ask questions to officers before we open the debate. Can I make it clear to participants and those who might be viewing uh, the live stream that members have had the benefit of the officer's report, which has been before us for uh, a few days now, so almost a week. Uh, we've also got the benefit of a supplementary list, which highlights a number of late uh, points that have been raised by objectors and applicants. Members are fully aware of the number of objections and the details of objections uh, submitted uh, by, uh, by um, objectors and applicants. Um, and those are covered in the officer's report. This meeting is treated and the process is exactly the same as would be the case were this a live meeting in that the debate will be open and uh, members will be able to uh, ask questions as I describe. So there is no veil of secrecy or hidden agenda as far as these items are concerned. They are dealt with in the same open and democratic manner as would otherwise be the case. So the first application, sorry, I've got an indication, Mrs. Sherrington, do you wish to speak at this stage, Councillor Sherrington? Uh, thank you, Chair. All it was, it was uh, to do with the um, Apologies, um, Councillor Abdullah had uh, told me that she was uh, unable to make the meeting and uh, was, so therefore I was just, because it wasn't mentioned about her apologies, I was just bringing it to the mind of uh, of uh, Mrs Ridge. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sherrington. Councillor Hayes, you have a question for officers. Is this on uh, the, the, the issues that are going to come before us or is it uh, following the presentation of the report. It's following the presentation of the report, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Hayes. Could I therefore uh, invite uh, Mrs Turton to present the first report, which is the application for land at Genova Road, uh, application 3818-18, and the direction of 
took three four-story buildings, 12 apartments, and full details are on the report. Mrs. Turk, please. Thank you. Um, this application is before members for decision at the request of Councillor Howarth, and there have also been in excess of six objections for a major proposal. Uh, this is an allocated housing site which is accessed from Minerva Road and sits directly adjacent to Bolton Hospital. A mix of residential units are proposed, 12 two-bed apartments and 18 five-bed shared occupancy units. The applicant has confirmed that the target market for the development are professionals, medical staff and students. A letter of support has been received from Bolton University confirming that the type of accommodation will support the future BCMS development. 98 car parking spaces are proposed, which exceeds the council standard. Sufficient amenity space and adequate landscaping are proposed. The layout largely meets interface distance as the dwellings are outside of the site. There is a minor shortfall between the side of Block 1 and the rear of properties on Kingsland Road, as detailed in paragraph 31 of the report. No Section 106 monies are proposed, as detailed in paragraph 61 to 67 of the officer's report. The application is considered to comply with policy and has an officer recommendation of approval. Um, members' attention is drawn to the list of supplementary information, which uh, clarifies um, information about unit size um, and confirms that this complies with the nationally defined space standards. Um, and there's also a minor amendment to condition nine. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Walsh, you're on mute. Thank you. Thank you for the report, Mr. Um, come from Ward Councillors. Councillor Howarth, you have five minutes to address the meeting. Thank you, Chair. Um, I object to this application and the material matters that I cite first are size and scale of the HMO development at 90 persons living in five rooms. That's HMO shared accommodation. Of course, there are some flats as well. And this is along with uh, the dramatic change to the character and appearance of the residential area which actually is reflected in that distance shortfall for Block 1 and homes on Kingsland Road. Material also, loss of outlook at the rear of Kingsland Road and at Colchester Drive, height of Block 2 and Block 3, from upper floors, overlook to gardens and back of homes at Kingsland Road. And I am citing traffic on this occasion as I think it is justified. Three four-storey residential buildings of mainly uh, HMO, uh, set up like hostel living for 90 persons, where the Wilfred Andrews estate, which has Kingsland Road, and Lancaster Avenue estate, which has Colchester Drive, that's large size and scale wise, and it completely changes this residential area. The four storey buildings are too close to Kingsland Road, that floodlit, uh, floodlights are needed, uh, which is raised by environmental officers in reports, uh, Angers residents at Colchester Drive and these streets because people don't want a floodlit environment uh, of that scale uh, changed to their neighbourhood at all. There are um, residents at properties on Kingsland Road who do strongly feel that their privacy will be deprived by the uh, by the four storey blocks and their homes will be unacceptably uh, overlooked. There is great concern about change to window views and garden use which is the material matter. Uh, there will be a reduction of natural light to gardens and homes, a possible increase in noise at homes from car park areas, from open windows in communal living areas. That is a concern. Um, there will be overlook and loss of privacy also due to side and back windows of the four storey blocks to Kingsland Road and Colchester Drive. And Block 3 has been moved closer to the back of properties at Colchester Drive to accommodate the major change to Block 2. This affects outlook at Colchester Drive and concerns there about privacy. The application is for 90 people to live in HMO accommodation. 
with flats. In 2018, the applicants said they were building four floors to get a good return. Now you have a marketing plan set out in uh, 2020 in the accommodation note from Daubcrest. And this tells you it's for doctors, professionals and students. There is a letter of support from the University of Bolton. Uh, student accommodation wasn't mentioned in the Skills College uh, planning application that uh, you've already heard last year. There was a travel plan in that and that talked about people travelling from areas outside of the borough. You don't have a statement on this from the Dean of Medicine or the University of Manchester, which is where doctors train and come from. Uh, again, no statement from the NHS actually about any need for staff accommodation. And they did tell the health scrutiny meeting, uh, one of the directors from one of the trusts in the NHS, that they weren't looking, that they didn't seem to have demand for specific staff accommodation. So one could say there's no guarantees, no agreements, no memorandums of understanding. You have more of a marketing plan and, and already uh, it's been indicated use of the open market for sale. Uh, problems with traffic uh, in this area. You've got emergency vehicles that need to use the roads here, patients in vehicles, there's a secondary school, visitors to the hospital. It's problem area already for traffic, it gets congested. Uh, this is a considerable number of increased people that would be living here uh, in this application. Uh, yes, 69 dwellings were approved in the past. It does mention that on a previous application, but, but uh, the transport uh, issue before you, the traffic issue before you, is not taking into consideration the skills college that was approved last year, which did highlight it would mean more additional traffic already to the area. So the traffic is a matter for all citizens in the borough and for every council ward, because the NHS in particular serves the whole borough and uh, four storey buildings will add to this congestion on Minerva Road. And I find on this occasion that this application should be refused. Thank you, Chair. We come now to the objector, Mr. Peter Bryan. Mr. Bryan, you've got three minutes to address the meeting, and then we'll invite you to take any questions from members. Uh, my, name, my name is Peter Bravin. I'm an active community champion for the area and as many of you know I'm concerned at the deteriorating conditions of the area. The 2016 application that was approved is still the ideal development scenario for this site as this is in keeping with the low density family residential nature of the area. The neighbourhood will be negatively impacted by the current proposal which is different from the original plans for the site due to economic benefits for the developer. This is at the expense of the community. The area, as already stated, is comprised of low density family orientated housing and the HMO element of the development is not in character with the area. I know that the developer stated that they see their target market for the development as being quote, it is intended that the future residents will therefore be professional medical staff working at the hospital or students attending the college. How will this be delivered? Will there be a covenant on the properties in respect of who can occupy them? If not, this is simply conjecture and is a concern due to the nature of other HMOs in the borough. Will the, will the committee consider a covenant on the properties? The provision of car parking is not in line with council policy as noted in the officer's report. This location is well served by buses that go to Bolton Farmworth and town centres and also to Manchester and other destinations. The climate emergency is all but real and this goes against the grain of substantiability. The location of the development next to the hospital is a potential threat to safety and security at the hospital if a covenant is not placed on the HMO element of the development. The height of the development will impact on the immunity of the adjoining properties, with them being overlooked and possibly light impact. To summarise, the scale and style of this development is not in keeping with the local neighbourhood, whereas the 2016 application is. The lives of the local community 
will be negatively impacted by this development. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brabin. We have a question from Councillor Hornby. Okay. Okay, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I've got four uh, quick questions, if I may. Um, but the first question, uh, is the HMO for 90 persons, uh, is that the main reason for the objections to this application? That's the first question. Is this for me, Mr. Brabin? Yes, it is, Mr. Brabin. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's for me. Yeah, that it is, exactly. I think it, it's, it's sort of for security at the hospital as well. If there was a covenant on it, that they, it was only used for medical staff, it would be okay. Okay, the, the second question, is the buildings being four storey high, uh, is that one of the main reasons for the uh, the 51 objections that came in? Yeah, well, it, it, it does impact on them, yeah. The height of the buildings does impact on them. Okay, uh, third, third question is, uh, would there be a less objections if the application were for a mixed uh, of houses and some flats on the site? Would, would, would that be a better compromise? I would, I would say so, yes, yes. Okay, I mean, finally... If, if the planning permission which they've had originally in 2016 was for residential properties, which was accepted. OK, and the final question is, I mean, we've we've all used Minerva Road on, on regular uh, occasions, whether it's to attend hospital ourselves or visit somebody in hospital. I'm just curious as to uh, the impact uh, with regard to the, the traffic on Minerva Road. Well, on Minerva Road at the busiest times in the evening and morning, the traffic can be queued up all through the hospital coming, coming down to Bradford Road at the busy times. So okay. it, it will have an impact on it as well. OK, thank you for that. And thank you, Chairman, for, your, for allowing me to the questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Brabin. Those are all the questions. We oh. turn then to uh, representative for the applicant, uh, Mr. Paul Sedgwick. Thank you, Chair. As set out in the Comprehensive Committee report, this is a proposed development of 30 residential units comprising 12 two-bed apartments and 18 five-person uh, five shared units. The site's allocated to housing development and as previously developed land, consent would allow housing development in a sequentially preferable location in the borough. The difficulty of developing previously developed sites in the borough has led to housing needs over time being partly met on other protected open land contrary to development plan policy. This site in particular has proved very difficult to viably develop and two previous residential schemes have failed to progress for this reason. The constraints to development include the former railway embankment, coal mining, a nearby mine shaft, a large sewer running through the length of the site. These matters significantly constrain where development can be located within the site and the normal costs involved in preparing the site for residential development and hence its viability. The form of development now proposed is a response to the difficulties in developing the site that the applicants have experienced since acquiring it 12 years ago. They do not welcome having hold of a site that they cannot economically develop. And that is the reason for this application and why no progress has been made on the site to date. In terms of design, the scheme is seen as being a transition between the hospital site and particularly the seven storey approved college building on the adjoining road frontage. It presents an elevation to Minerva Road that is residential in character but references the elevational treatment of the college building. Objectors have expressed concerns about the future occupancy of the buildings, and particularly as them becoming a focus for social accommodation for unemployed or other people in need. This development would be purely privately funded and is directed at providing good quality and therefore premium priced accommodation 
that is accessible and flexible to meet the needs of a mobile population, including students, medical and care staff, whether working locally or in the wider area. To be attractive to mainly career-oriented clientele, any stigma, such as that referenced in the objections, must be avoided for commercial reasons alone. The pressure on care staff, including medical and nursing students, that have been recognised in the ongoing response to the pandemic, emphasises the benefits of having such accommodation available in this area. It's also relevant that it's within easy walking distance of the college and the hospital, and that is both sustainable and reduces any concerns about the traffic pressure on Minerva Road. Overall, I can you have your three minutes, Mr. Sedgwick. Could you sum up in one sentence, please? Yep. Overall, I consider the application to be appropriate development of the site, meeting challenges and bringing it forward for development. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Sedgwick. We have a question from Councillor Peel. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so question for Mr. Sedgwick. Um, I understand the um, the point you're making about the um, feasibility of developing the site. Um, the report um, uh, says uh, 12 two bed apartments and 18 five bed um, uh, shared um, units. That's 114 uh, beds in total. Can I ask um, what was the process to get into this figure of uh, 114 beds? And Chairman, I probably uh, will want a, uh, a supplementary. Yes, the the approach was to see what development we could reasonably get on the site. It was concluded that three four-storey blocks could fit in without harm to neighbours and that is substantiated in the planning officer's report. The content of those blocks is gives us the uh, number of bed, bedrooms that you refer to. Thank you, Josh. Come back, Councillor Field. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, my supplementary question here is um, uh, the applicant stated that the target market uh, professionals, medical staff, etc., or students. Um, what um, research or what conversations have taken place between yourselves and the hospital or the college in terms of the target market being 114? I'm still really following this line about where 114 beds come into it. Yes, it is the not a requirement for us to demonstrate a market for the development. The development will succeed or not, depending on that market existing and funding becoming available because it does exist. If it doesn't exist, then it won't happen, quite simply, and that site will remain a derelict mess for a considerable period of time because I can't think of another way of bringing development forward on it. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Sedgwick. Uh, I just wanted to ask you about the security on this particular site. Um, I know that you've got fencing around it and you're going to have gates and everything, but I was just wondering, what kind of uh, mechanism are you going to have on these gates? Because I'm very, very concerned that if you've got like student nurses, student doctors, then they are uh, liable to get people uh, wandering in there. So it's very important that they are actually uh, felt secure when they move into this particular, uh, these particular properties. So I was wondering if you could uh, tell me. Thank you. Yeah, no, I quite, I quite agree with that. Hence the secure fencing around. The access to the gate would be, it's not, it's not determined yet, but it would be some form of past fog or whatever. There'll be 
strict control, I mean, it, the, getting into the buildings is not e easy. There's only a single door to each of the three blocks, a single main entrance. There'll be vi video um, coverage of, of the area generally. And that, that see, seems to me, and I've looked into it in detail, that it's probably more secure than a, de a development that's got more fragmented uses on it, such as gar gardens and uh, different forms of car parking. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Edward. Thank you. Um, we now to um, questions to officers, and I've got two thus far. Uh, Councillor Hayes. Yes, thank you, Chair. Two questions about Section 106 monies. Um, the first one is, I'm a simple soul, uh, and to me a dwelling is something somewhere where people live. Uh, I'm just wondering if we can have a little more explanation about why this doesn't count as dwelling, or part of it doesn't. The second question is on paragraph 66, uh, about the um, uh, no uh, health uh, and well-being contribution uh, and it says if I can read it they've not confirmed that a contribution is required in this instance is this because they never came back or because they positively said we don't require a contribution uh, I'm very surprised if they're not we're not uh, requiring a contribution for this as we can't for anything else uh, Mr. Are you taking this one? Oh, Mr. Allen Oh. Thank you, Chair. Um, so for the first question in terms of what constitutes a dwelling, um, I did actually contact the legal section about this. It's, it's not as straightforward as, as you might think. Um, so they confirmed that um, a dwelling would include a, a flat, a house or a maisonette. Um, and so strictly speaking, these if, if this accommodation is um, a unit which is in multiple occupation, which um, may house students on a more temporary basis or, or, or key workers that aren't necessarily living, it on, living in them on a full-time basis. Um, it doesn't strictly include that. It's, um, it, it is a complicated one. And um, as I say, one that we did get legal advice on. And even then it, it wasn't something that um, we got necessarily the straight, most straightforward answer on. So I do understand that confusion. Um, the other question about the um, Bolton Clinical Commissioning Group and in terms of the health contribution, um, for all applications for major developments um, that are for residential schemes, we do consult the CCG. And um, unfortunately, very we get very few responses. The um, the SPD does require that we um, have to justify any commuted sum that we ask for. So if we don't get a response, we have to take the assumption that um, they they don't require it in this instance. Um, otherwise, we can't justify that that figure to the to the applicant. I'm afraid. Thank you, Chair. Can I come back? Can I come back on that, Chair, please, briefly? Yes, yes, yes. Um, can I, say, I, I understand the answer and uh, it's unfortunate. I think obviously you're probably right in the circumstances. But can I suggest that at some level we do have communications with the, uh, the health body uh, and point out to them they're missing funding, which is a great shame in the NHS nowadays. Thank you very much, Chair. Okay, if your point is noted, that will be uh, taken up elsewhere. Thank you. Not for this committee to. Uh, on the stage. Councillor Allen. Thank you, Chair. A couple of questions, if I may, for, for officers, for Mrs. Turton. Um, first one leads on from what Councillor Hayes has just been saying, really, and it's the fact that um, half of these 
dwellings, if I can use that word, half of them are not really dwellings at all. Uh, they're nothing more than bedrooms. They don't even have basic sanitary uh, fittings. Um, as well as as well as getting the applicants out of paying one or six money, this also seems to get the applicants out of complying with minimum space standards. And I wonder if uh, Mrs. Turtle would like to comment on that. And then secondly, um, regarding the whole site, we have elevation drawings that show the each of the blocks. What we don't have is an elevation drawing that shows the blocks in relation to the houses on Kingland Road. So I wonder if you could just describe, if possible, what the relative height differential is between the two story houses on Kingland Road and the four story blocks, which are on a uh, slightly elevated uh, plateau. Does that make sense? Thanks, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor Allen. Um, so in terms of the space standards, the um, I have checked the space standards for both the two bedroom apartments and the five bedroom multiple occupancy units, and they do all meet the nationally described space standards. Um, so that that is something that it, it definitely complies with that and I have checked that. Um, the other thing is the elevation, the, the gradient. There is a gradient between the two. So the application site is on a, an elevated site in comparison to the to Kingsland Road. Um, the, I, I suppose the only thing I can say is that the interface distance guidance adds three metres per um, storey, essentially, of difference. And so the apart from the shortfall of 1.5 metres, I think it is between the side of block one and the rear of properties on Kingsland Road, um, the interface distances are exceeded to take into account that um, that gradient there. Thank you, Chair. No further questions, so we come then to uh, the debate. Uh, ward councillors normally have the first opportunity to speak on these matters. Councillor Mistry. Thank you, Chair. Uh, first of all, this application came to the authority in 2004, uh, which is almost about 16 years ago. We approved it for the principle of building houses on it. But in 2006, uh, we approved the application for 17 three bedroom houses and two, 12 two bedroom on both occasions. I did not object to this application because I thought these properties would fit in in the existing feature of the whole area. And the residents at the time had the same sort of objections. But I took the view that it was acceptable and voted for it. Uh, 14 years on, it's come back again. And this time it's totally changed. The application is for three blocks of four story buildings crammed in what I see is a very small site. You know, the reports tend to indicate that they have amended the plans, you know, and reduced the size of apartments, increased the two, two apartments from 10 to 12 and reduced the shed from eight from 18 to 20 on each side. Uh, total reduction of almost about 10 percent. I do not consider the design and the scale of apartment as acceptable in this occasion. Uh, they will be overbearing, inappropriate. My colleague, Councillor Howarth, uh, and the objectors has actually touched on all the other points that I'm going to look into, and I don't intend to repeat because they're pretty relevant to this particular application. The developer is cramming as many units as he can for a small for, for financial gain, and I, I can quite understand the reasons for it, but they haven't taken the consideration of uh, all the current, you know, the pressure on the infrastructures, road and amenities within the area. And it is again, it's an overdevelopment in a very small site. We put a lot of emphasis on the interface distance in the past applications. Uh, I know I do accept that the two apartments do beat the interface distance, but one of them doesn't. The three blocks are high and overlooking into neighboring properties, uh, which will have impact on the privacy. 
the question we need to ask is, is it going to be the right type of development? And do we allow this to happen near the hospital? Uh, Bolton is fortunate enough to have secured funding to build a new skills college, first of its kind in the country. The landscape is going to change with this new, new building in the hospital grounds. Uh, it'd be nice if the developer decides to go back and come with some change his designs and come with properties that would be fitting within that area, uh, which will, you know, which will probably blend into the existing and I wouldn't have no objection to that. I think Councillor Hayes has touched on, on 106 monies and paragraph 1 to, you know, 61 to, uh, in the report talks about infrastructure contribution. Well, I do not accept the argument in the report. There must be some 106 monies coming from this development. Uh, should this application be approved? My two colleagues and me, we both totally against this application. And the planning committee has always taken the views of the local ward councillors in making these decisions. I'm hoping the committee will uh, take our views in consideration. Uh, as far as the developer concerned, I can understand his uh, problems, but I think he can come back. He will, I'm sure, will come back with a better uh, design which would be fitting within this area. And for those reasons, I move refusal. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Mr. Uh, Councillor Hayes. Thank you, Chair. I accept the difficulty of developing the site. I also can accept there may well be a demand for the type of accommodation being proposed. But to me, it is totally out of scale. You have a, a building which is effectively on a, a ground which is very much higher than the houses behind it, which re effectively, instead of four storeys, would make it five storeys. You also have a roof with a fairly steep pitch, which increases the size of matting even further. And although we don't look at what might come in the future, I can see it quite possible we may have requests for uh, rooms in that roof at some stage. So I am also worried about the traffic, although the main one is the size of the building in comparison with the houses behind it. And I'm very happy to second Councillor Mystery uh, in recommending refusal. Thank you, Councillor Hayes. Councillor Peel. Thank you, Chairman. Um, my starting point on this is obviously the principle of the development, and I think the principle of, um, of the housing development here on this piece of land is, is established and it's sound. Um, there are issues about the size and scale of the blocks uh, that are proposed, and I think, unfortunately, the, the size and scale of the, of the proposed blocks are actually now intertwined with the nature of the accommodation. Uh, which I'll come back to. Just a, uh, a side point on 106 monies. I think um, I don't find if we were to accept this application um, because it's um, affordable uh, housing, which is your next best thing to social housing. I think um, that's probably the reason 106 is disregarded because that is a form of 106, the provision of affordable housing. But that for me is a side issue. Uh, what I want to talk about is that I'm not um, I'm not happy that, um, that, that the reason that's being given for the development is actually a proven reason. Um, it may well be a good idea to say that um, um, we want to target these properties at uh, professionals, medical staff and students, etc. But I don't think there's any evidence um, that uh, 114 uh, beds are, are needed to fill this gap. Th there may well be a demand. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, consultants and, and, and doctors, et cetera, would, would particularly uh, want to want to live there uh, simply because it, it would, um, it, it, it's just not needed. I mean, people who do um, night shifts, et cetera, at, at the hospital, 
Um, they no longer, I'm assured, that no longer sleep on, on couches, etc. There is accommodation provided. There may well be a demand for um, some kind of um, student accommodation or even some uh, kind of accommodation for uh, new staff at the hospital. Say people who are moving in, into Bolton and need to be housed on a temporary basis. And these schemes exist, you know, for, for 12 months contracts, much like student halls of residence, um, the idea of that. But I just don't think that um, there is an argument that's been proven or made that um, this is a, that this is an acceptable form of a HMO because it is a HMO. It's a huge HMO. It, it's akin to a um, 114 bed hostel. And the only reason you would probably allow a 114 bed hostel would be for a specific reason. For example, it could be student halls of residence. It could be temporary accommodation for medical staff, uh, but I just don't think that is the case at all. And I think once that argument has been exhausted and whatever um, efforts are made uh, to get um, those desired uh, tenants in the building, it would just go out to the market, letting agents would be used and eventually it would just become um, a single person uh, hostel, um, the likes of which we, as far as I'm aware, don't have in Bolton. Of course, there's a need for houses and multiple occupancy. Of course, there's a demand for that. Of course, there's a transient population, but not on this size or scale. They tend to be smaller units. They tend to be converted large houses, etc. Um, and I think that's where uh, this application um, trips itself up. It, it's speculative. It's a speculative ap application and, it, and it's dressed up to um, fulfil a demand uh, that isn't proven. Um, I, I, it's a commercial decision and, it, and it's not a decision that's really in the interest of the hospital. And that's fine. That's fine. You know, applicants can make these types of um, commercial decisions. But um, the idea um, that's, that's expressed in the report may well be a good idea, but it isn't proven. And I think that's the point. And therefore, I would second refusal uh, on the grounds of overdevelopment. Thank you, Chair. Who did you call then, Chair? Councillor Allen. Thank you, Chair. Most issues have been uh, ably covered by uh, Councillor Peel and Councillor Hayes, I think. Um, uh, I support refusal of this application, um, basically on two two grounds, I think, that, that, that a planning inspector might also support. And that is the overbearing uh, nature uh, of the development due to its size, its scale, the elevation above the houses on Kingsland Road, uh, an issue such as that. Uh, and the second reason, which hasn't been covered really, is the amenity space. Um, the amenity space for more than 100 residents is pretty minimal. Uh, and it's right at one end of the development. It's at the, the bottom corner. So it's unlikely to be used by the people, for example, in block one. It's a long way from where from where they are. So I think the amenity space is is not uh, is not acceptable. Um, I agree with Councillor Hayes' comments about Section 106 money. I think this is a bit of a cop out, really, and I think there should be some 106 money. Um, the objector referred a few times to uh, a covenant. Uh, on this property, which would ensure that, that it was only uh, let or sold to uh, people from the hospital. Uh, just for the sake of clarity, it's not within the planning committee's uh, power to impose a covenant uh, on any site. I think that's pretty well the, uh, uh, the gift of the landowner to impose the covenant, uh, much as we might like to do. Um, so really, that's it, uh, Chair. It's uh, it's overbearing. It's too big, 
and the amenity space is uh, inadequate. So I'll be supporting refusal. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Uh, I don't know that Councillor Newell wants to speak on this one. Do you still wish to speak, Councillor Newell? Uh, no, Chair, the points I wanted to make have already been raised. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Newell. Uh, Councillor Darvesh. Thank you, Chair. Um, I actually uh, read this application completely wrong from everybody else. Um, just one comment, first of all, in terms of what Councillor Hayes was saying about the Section 106 agreements. Um, it, there is a little paragraph in there which talks about the abnormal ground and therefore the applicant is not able to meet the CO2 targets. Now, as daft as it seems, even if there was money allocated for Section 106, these type of developers, and we're used to seeing this these days, will end up show, telling us that the abnormal ground means that the viability is not going to stack up and therefore we won't get any Section 106. So I think either way, if there was some sort of Section 106 contributions, I don't think we would have got it anyway. I actually had a look at, I, I saw this site as a key worker development opportunity. I think it complements the uh, the university building. Councillor Peel mentioned it was speculative, but the, the, the truth is there's not many applications that gets the support of the university. Um, I saw this as a, as a brilliant opportunity for students. Those HMOs are actually the posh word, I would say, because I'm used to picking my kids up from university, the student clusters. They've all got ensuite facilities uh, and they're designed like HMOs, but they do actually work and they're designed for, for students. Um, interface distances are actually okay, meaning the height of the buildings must be okay. Uh, highways, well, it, 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 there's an argument to actually say that the fact that the students are accommodated very close to the hospital means there should not be that many cars actually on the road. So from a student perspective, I, I think it's probably got the right amount of car parking and therefore not that much impact on the highways and highways officers are comfortable with it as well. Um, Councillor Allen mentioned amenity space. You know, amenity space on this occasion actually works out OK. There, there is some amenity space actually on the site itself. Um, which adds up in terms of what is actually allowed per individual. Uh, in, per individual, uh, normally on these type of application, what you actually end up seeing is balconies, which end up being the amenity space. So I actually saw a lot of positives in this application, um, especially with the with the uh, medical college coming up close by. A big demand for students. So I will still move approval on this application. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Hmm. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I always been of the view that uh, we listen very carefully to ward councillors with regard to planning applications. And, and I think on this occasion, ward councillors have got it totally right. They know the ward, they know the area. We all know this particular stretch. Minerva Road has to be one of the busiest roads, not just for local people, from people from all over the northwest visiting what is an excellent hospital. I think the threat that uh, if we, planning permission isn't given, then this land could remain derelict for some time is a no-brainer. I think it, it's the right development on this site and we would be happy, happy with, with, with that. Uh, I don't have a problem with that land being developed. As the with the questions that I asked the objector, he made it quite clear that uh, they're not objecting to development on that piece of land. They're objecting to this over development on this land. And for me also, as indeed on previous applications, the Section 106 we've been had over yet time and time again. So I would like to support refusal on this application, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. 
I have uh, no further speakers on this one, uh, but uh, Mr. Um, Allen, I think just wants to clarify the reason given for refusal. Um, but I am told that the control and uh, use of the accommodation and who could occupy it could be controlled by condition uh, on the uh, approval if members are minded to approve the application. Uh, but Mr. Allen, do you want to uh, speak to address the issues raised for refusal? Thanks, thanks, Chair. I mean, obviously, this obviously my comments only apply if members are minded for minded to refuse it. And just obviously, just to clarify, um, as I see it, as discussed by members, the key, the key reasons. Um, and I, th I think it, it is pretty clear in this instance that the uh, members, some members, consider that the proposal is out of character with the area and would have an over overbearing and inappropriate impacts on the character area and also the uh, living conditions of the adjoining properties on Kingsland Road. Um, obviously, in terms of the, the size scale ma massing of the, of the properties, and um, while I think whilst the officer's report does talk about amenity space um, be, being compliant with our with I think with our standards, um, obviously it's, I think it's more the uneven um, distribution throughout the site. So it's obviously potentially not usable by all of the three uh, occupiers of the blocks. Um, I think that's th those. Th yeah, those are the key, the key issues um, in terms of the members' wishes. Anyway, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Allen. It has been moved and seconded uh, that this application should be refused. There's an amendment moved by Councillor Darvesh that was, that was not seconded, and therefore members have been invited to vote for the proposal that the application should be refused. So it is for a refusal or against refusal. This is Rick, could you take the vote please? Yeah, thank you Councillor Wells. So the motion before committee is to, to refuse the application. So Councillor Allen? For. Councillor Ayub? For. Councillor Connor? For. Councillor Darvish? Against. Councillor Dean? For. Councillor Hayes. Four. Councillor Hornby. Four. Councillor Mystery. Four. Councillor Morris. Four. Councillor Newell. Four. Councillor Peel. Four. Councillor Radcliffe. Four. Councillor Sanders. Four. Councillor Sherrington. Four. Councillor Walsh. Councillor Walsh? Four. Councillor Waters? Four. The application is refused. Thank you, members. Uh. Well, refused, the application is refused. Well, we now move to the second application. Before we come to that, Mrs Ridge, do you want to uh, get the object from supporter? Yes, yeah, Chairman. Councillor Flickcroft is speaking on this as a ward councillor and he's in the meeting. Mr Sedgwick is the supporter and he's so he's staying on the line. I'm just now going to go and ring the objector. Okay. Mr. When you have spoken, you will need to leave the meeting, of course, for the duration of this uh, item. Yes, Chair. Mrs Gorman. Mrs. Gorman. I'm trying to address Councillor Wright your point. You you weren't asked to vote. Yeah. It wouldn't be material to the vote, but uh, we will take your we'll record your vote when Mrs. Ridge returns. Mm -hmm.
Oh. Chair, that was the objector who's just come into the meeting, but I also think Mr Brabham's still on in the meeting. Yes, He's speaking to me now. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, Mr Brabham, Hello. you can leave the yes. meeting now. Okay, thank you. Bye. All right, thank you. Bye. Right, can you hear me, yeah? Uh, yes. yes. Okay, right. Do you want me um, to start? Uh, no, no, no. Just, just one, please, sir. Four. Uh, you're breaking up. What, what is it you're saying? Sorry. I'm sorry. Is that um, Mrs Rayner? It is Mrs Rayner, yes. Right. If you could uh, just wait, please. We'll come to your comments in a few moments. That's so, fine. I just, uh, Mrs. Ridge. It's yes. Councillor Wright didn't vote on the last item. Right. No, he didn't. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Councillor Wright. That's my <laughs> fault. Yeah, perfectly all right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it wasn't material <laughs> to the outcome, but uh, if we could record the vote, please. It's, something. Yeah, to yes. record it is four. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. We turn now to the application for land adjacent to 76 Cross Street Farmworth on page 31 of the bundle and its erection of 11 dwellings with associated access landscaping and car parking. Uh, Mr. Turton, I believe you're going to speak that. Before you do so, can I just uh, point out, sorry, for the benefit of uh, uh, Mrs. Rayner, the, the process will be that Ms. Turton will uh, outline the application. Uh, we will then invite uh, Councillor Flickcroft as a ward councillor who wishes to speak for up to five minutes, following which uh, Ms. Rayner, you will be invited to speak as an objector for three minutes and to take any questions uh, from uh, members of the committee. We will then invite uh, Mr. Sedgwick on behalf of the applicant to speak again for three minutes and to take any questions uh, from members, after which members will be able to ask questions to officers before we go into the debate. So you, at this stage, Mr. Rainey, you're here to listen to the presentation, followed by Councillor Trickcroft, followed by yourself. OK. Uh, thank you. So, Mr. Okay. Turton, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Firstly, members' attention is drawn to the application description, which should read 11 and not 12 dwellings. And I apologise for the typing mistake. Um, the application is before committee due to receiving more than six letters of objection. And this is a former scrapyard site, part of the wider Farmworth Industrial Estate. The site has a housing allocation and therefore the principle of residential development has already been established. The main issues which are addressed in the committee report are the design and impact on the listed Farmworth Park, um, impact on residential amenity and access. Due to the historical layout of the mill site, the access is constrained. Um, in addition to the information contained in the committee report, additional conditions are recommended to increase safety of access into the site in the form of speed restrictions and priority signage and increasing visibility from the existing garage in the form of possibly in the form of a mirror. A condition is also required for details of the footpath link to the park, ensuring that adequate um, width and boundary treatment. Members will also note that the site plan shows a gated access. This is to be deleted from the proposed scheme. As detailed in the committee report, the proposed development is considered to comply with policy, hence the officer's recommendation of approval. Members' attention is drawn to the list of supplementary information, which contains quite a lot of information for this application. Members will note that further emails have been received from the main objector. Of note are issues regarding the garage and access to the site. A photo illustrates this. Pedestrian safety and interface distances between proposed plot 11 and number 13 Park View. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Ms Turton. Could I now invite Councillor Fitzpatrick's Ward Council, please, to speak? You have five minutes to address the meeting. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee. Can I begin by highlighting the concern of Mrs Rayner of Park View, um, where her garage um, access is only by the rear of a property on Cross Street. 
the area where her garage opens out onto a single width road is extremely worrying for her. In respect of access in and out of her garage, the plans indicate that the pedestrian route is directed to the garage side of the site. What if there was someone with a pram leaving the site and Mrs Rayner exit in her garage? It doesn't bear to think, be thinking about. Can something be done with the proposed highway design in this area to make it safer for road users and pedestrians alike? The car parking quotient is insufficient for this development. Proposed conditions say 14 spaces will be provided with the possibility of three plots accommodating two vehicles depending on size. Only if these vehicles are small will that happen. National standards dictate that 2.25 spaces per three bed semi detached house, giving a minimum requirement of 25 spaces. This development's proposed parking facility is 28% less than the national requirements. Where will these extra cars park, you may ask? They may park in unspecified spaces on the development and in doing so cause hazards and no doubt problems for other road users and also impeding the sweep area for large vehicles, for example, the bin wagons. All of this in an area where street parking has already been highlighted as an issue by officers. It is recognised by officers that the highway is not able to be built to adoptable standards and so will always have to remain a private road. This opportunity before us now is the only chance available to make sure that this safety is built into the design. Let's make sure we get it right. I'm not sure if any committee members who are not familiar with this area have had chance to visit the site. If so, you will have noticed firsthand how narrow this street is. The primary concern here is for safety, pedestrians and drivers, but also a major concern here for future residents of the site from the effects of the ground contamination from the proximity of the old gas works and the scrapyard. Appropriate environmental investigations and measures must be put in place prior to commencement to ensure this land is safe for houses to be built on. Most residents nearby are aware that this land is included in the housing allocation plan and as such accept that houses will be built on it. Being on the allocation plan doesn't mean that regulations are not adhered to. It has to be done correctly. This development is relatively small, but it has recommendations for approval with 18 or maybe no 19 conditions attached. If members are minded not to refuse this, would it not be best practice to defer this application and ask the applicant to put things in place to enable some of the conditions to be removed rather than just taking a chance on these conditions, many of them safety focused, to be implemented at a later date. Thank you. So you're off to speak for three minutes and then to answer any questions from members of the committee. OK. Thank you, Mrs. Uh, thank you. Right. There are many reasons the planning committee should refuse the application, which are mainly concerned with health and safety of local residents, the general public, myself and the re residents of the development, should the current proposals go ahead. The three minutes cannot give my comments justice, so I will try to articulate my main points as follows. I've discussed this at great length with Bolton Planning. Firstly, in the breach of policy P5 regarding the safety of pedestrians and cyclists over vehicles, I have provided a photo of my car leaving my garage, which also shows that the opening of my garage is directly onto the narrow 4.7 metre wide proposed access road, which I own. It has no footpath and has never been used by the public. The site plan directs pedestrians directly across the front of my garage. The support photo supplied to Bolton Planning clearly shows that this will have a severely, I will have a severely hampered view until I am around two metres outside of my garage, putting pedestrians, myself and other road users at risk of a serious accident. Item 42 acknowledges that Cross Street already suffers from parking congestion, yet Item 44 highlights that post on-site parking provision is below the required standard. Why is this being overlooked when this will compound the already existing parking congestion issue and compromise road safety? Another issue is the SPD interface between required principal window and plot 11, which should be 13.5 metres, 
not the current 12 metres. The external bodies, HSE and the local flood, have uh, also recommended that the plan should be rejected. Yet these calls are being dismissed without any sufficient reasoning. Health and safety indicate that the site falls within the hazardous zone and the flood risk assessment said that they wanted a full investigation, which hasn't been done yet. I am struggling to understand how this planning has reached this stage. I am strongly encouraging the committee to reject this application until all health and safety concerns are adequately addressed. I would like to be given the opportunity to get a risk assessment carried out regarding the access road and would request that the committee at least delay a decision until such time that, I can be, that this can be conducted and a report issued, as I think safety is paramount. And I am concerned that I may be liable for any accidents on my property as I own the access road land. I am asking the committee to delay or reject the approval of these plans until these safety, these very serious safety issues are resolved. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gray. I yeah. have no indication uh, from members of any questions. So uh, thank you for that. We come then to uh, speak on behalf of the applicant, uh, Mr. Paul Sedgwick. Mr. Sedgwick, you have yep. uh, three minutes to address the committee and then to take any questions. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, as set out in the comprehensive committee report, this is a proposed development of 11 dwellings on the site of a former scrapyard, which is sited on the edge of the Grade 2 listed Farmworth Park. The previous use of a scrapyard was an unattractive neighbour to the park, causing noise and disturbance throughout the day. The industrial uses of the site have left a legacy of contamination and housing development would be required to remediate the site and bring it to the state where it is a safe residential environment. And it's wor worth noting, Chair, as you well know, that it's normal practice for consents to be given with conditions that require subsequent work rather than expecting all work to be carried out before the application is submitted. The access to the proposed residential use utilises Cross Street and it would be a significant improvement to the environment of those dwellings for the cessation of industrial access. In particular, the, site, the use of the site by a private car is environmentally far preferable to its use throughout the day by goods vehicles. And I have in mind there that it could be skip wagons and larger bolters which are used by the scrap businesses, which are, is the previous use of the site and therefore still a legal use with planning permission. This change of use would also benef benefit the owner of the garage. Egre egress from the garage would be easier and safer in the absence of commercial vehicles, especially as cars will be moving slowly and are more amenable to signage and restriction and also the people living there will be well aware of this situation with regard to the garage. So I, I think there's benefits in this consent with regard to access to the garage. I think it's all, also worthwhile emphasising the development meets or exceeds all of the separation distances used by the council. And as a result, there's no loss of privacy, over dominance or other adverse impact arising from the proposals. I consider the application to be appropriate development of the site, meeting clear policy requirements and making a permanent improvement to the setting and enjoyment of the listed farm roof park. There are no other matters that would outweigh these benefits and the prospect of the use reverting to authorised you know, scrapyard add emphasis to the benefits of the application, the approval of which I commend to the committee. Next week, a question from Councillor Allen. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Sedgwick, just, just one question, really. Um, access to and from the garage seems to be a, uh, a major issue for objectors. Uh, as the applicant, did you consider this uh, when you came up with the plan? 
uh, were there any alternative measures that perhaps you thought of and dismissed? Uh, is there anything that you can now do to improve uh, that, uh, egress? Thank you. Yeah, it, 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 it was always a matter of concern, but it's an existing situation. Um, there was an approach made to acquire the garage as part of the site. That, that was rebuffed. Um, that would have answered the question, and a, a different structure could have been put on that site with better access. Um, the applicant does not own that st stretch of the access in front of the garage, and it, but has a full right of access across it. So again, I, I think reverting or going to residential use is far preferable to have it, having skip wagons running up and down there. Um, and we, we all know they're not the, the, the most placid of drivers. So I, I think that's, it, it's the only alternative to getting into the site, it's the only option of getting into the site. Um, and with some careful treatment and the provision of mirrors and signage, I think it becomes much safer with the residential use than if nothing was done. Okay, thank you. I think to uh, say to it, I come then to questions to officers. Um, can I just ask officers to clarify one point, which is in the supplementary uh, list, uh, and that was a point raised by the objector about the uh, flood uh, risk uh, analysis and also the HMS uh, Health and Safety Executive objection hazardous waste insulation. It is referred to in this late list, but uh, could you clarify that point, please, the benefit of all involved? Yes, sir. Sorry, is, is this directed at me, Chair? No, uh, sorry. No, I I was, no, that, was to, that was to Miss Turton. I thought that Miss Cedric had said thank you. There were no right, further no, questions. Fine. Yep, good. Thank you, Chair. So in terms of the flood risk um, uh, information, the, the drainage information, so um, the, flood, uh, the normal procedure, if the information hasn't been submitted with the application, then flood risk will often ask for that to be submitted and they will object to the application on that basis. Discussions have been had with flood risk. Um, some drainage information has been submitted. There is some outstanding drainage information. The applicant has tried to get additional information, but given the coronavirus situation, they haven't been able to get um, the, the, the right consultants on site to do that. Conversations have been had with flood risk and they're happy for, the, for, the, uh, for a condition so that that information is submitted after this date. So that's, they, they are happy with that. In terms of the health and safety, there is a, a redundant gas holder, which is on Gas Street, I believe, trying to remember um, that um, the health and safety executive, there's a, um, uh, a um, I can't remember what it's called, um, that there is a consultation area around the, the gas holder, which includes the cross street site. So we have to consult um, the, the HSE on, on any application that could affect that. They've got back to us and said that actually that's been decommissioned and we as a council are in the process of removing that consultation zone um, so that is again again not not an issue in terms of the health and safety of the of the site um, in terms of contaminated land um, the pollution control have assessed the proposal they're happy with the submitted information and they've recommended a condition as is normal for for any residential development thank you chair Another question from Councillor Peel. Thanks, Chairman. Um, when was the um, when when I was trying to find in the report, and I don't think it's specific about when the um, the, the site was last in use. Um, it was a scrapyard. Um, when was that? I'll have a supplementary. I think that was approximately 10 years ago from memory. Okay. 
Councillor Field. Okay, uh, thanks. Um, because <clears throat> item um, paragraph forty three is quite um, is the um, the key paragraph to this particular discussion, and it um, it says highways engineers concluded that the trip generation from the proposed residential use will be less than the extant use, um, which is also the point made by the the applicant. So I presume, um, Mr. We we have the um, um, the uh, vehicle uh, um, counter evidence to to support that statement. Um, I think I'm not aware that we've got the vehicle count. It, it goes on the type of use. So a scrapyard use would have vehicles, heavy good vehicles, using that narrow road. Um, it's an extant use. There have been no um, other uses that we're aware of in that time. Um, and so unless a case of abandonment could be um, proven, then the scrapyard use could restart at any time and um, the type of vehicles that would use that route would be heavy goods vehicles and skips and um, there would be a higher vehicle movement than a, a small residential development there. Thank you. Um, no further questions, so we open the back of the debate. I invite Council Sanders as Ward Council, please. Can I ask a question? I'm sorry, who is that? It's Mrs. Rayner. I'm sorry, sorry, you can't ask questions at this oh, stage, Mrs. Rayner. Okay, all right. Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay, thank you, Chair, members of uh, committee. Um, from a ward councillor perspective, um, I respect all the points raised by residents and by my farm board colleague this afternoon. Um, as a member of planning committee, of course, I remain neutral in evaluating um, this application. For committee members not familiar with this location, if you were to um, exit the former scrapyard site and begin to walk up Cross Street, um, you would see Farmer Town Centre emerging directly in front of you. Um, so to begin with, um, committee should recognise that this application meets key policies and strategies. It is allocated on the housing um, allocations plan. It's covered by the core strategy for new housing on Brownfield site in Farmworth and has been identified as future residential use in the 2019 Farmworth Town Centre regeneration plan. So on balance, um, I am minded to agree that a cul-de-sac on this site would reasonably expand upon the residential uses of uh, nearby streets in that area. In terms of the site's elevated position, over um, the Grade 2 listed park. It's fair to note that cul-de-sacs have been situated for numerous years along the boundaries of the other side of Falmouth Park with approximately, um, I think it's in the region of about 20 overlooking back elevations that look over the park. Um, a mixture of red and beige bricks were used on those properties, um, but I feel um, that although taller in this case, these um, properties, the red brick elevation shown in the plans would um, probably better complement the housing mills and civic buildings that are sited um, in that corner of our park. Um, as noted in the officer's report, a pedestrian route through um, the site boundary, um, through the boundary wall into the park is an ambition as part of the Falmouth Town Centre Master Plan um, as one of the key links um, to join destinations across the town centre. Um, the provision of this within the application can be welcomed, um, but it's clear that further work is needed between the applicants and officers um, to establish a feasible and appropriate plan. Um, but I am satisfied on hearing today that that can now be a condition um, within the um, within the application. Um, considering the site um, next to the park, um, it is very disappointing um, that the applicant did not include any biodiversity enhancements in the original um, application. However, um, condition four um, regarding biodiversity, I believe will enhance this. Um, just touching on um, what Jody has just mentioned in regards to Council Appeal's question, um, I am reassured by the flood risk insisting on a condition to cover all drainage matters. 
Um, and I feel that the condition, I believe it's um, condition two, will ensure that potential land contamination issues or issues relating to former gas works on gas street um, will be acted on appropriately. And I must add that I think it's positive. Um, I think members will be pleased to see that electric vehicle charging points have been included in condition six. Um, I'll try not to take too much more time. So on to the more challenging aspects of this application. Um, clearly listening to the concerns of Mrs Rayner at 13 Parkview, it is paramount that the planning authority ensures that the interface um, distances satisfied in the report reflect any site, uh, any building, sorry, on site if um, the application should be approved. Um, on to the highways matters again, which is raised um, and it's a, an important issue. This lower portion of Cross Street experiences on street parking and does become narrower as we approach the site entrance way. Um, I personally found the transport statement in the, um, the application to be lacking in detail and not particularly helpful, to be honest. Um, but the tracking analysis shows the ability for ref refuge collection, sorry, to access the site and manoeuvre and exit safely. However, this does not necessarily account for extra on-street parking that could occur on or around the cul-de-sac as the overall parking spaces do not meet um, the maximum standard. Um, the sustainable location and access to walking, cycling, bus and train within minutes of this site will get around this issue in terms of planning, but does not necessarily solve a potential um, problem. I fully understand the nervousness about the width of the final five metres of road leading to the site and that the garage opens at a right angle onto this narrow access road. Um, highways engineers conclude overall, as been as has been stated um, previously, that um, the development and access way could not be considered um, to pose a severe impact in terms of traffic or road safety and the test that uh, must be met. Um, I welcome um, wider members' opinions on this um, in the debate. Um, I do feel that there is an opportunity here for all options to be looked at um, to help mitigate the issues and safety concerns around the entrance way and garage and to increase parking provision on the site. Signage for cars and pedestrians um, on the placement of mirrors to assist um, the use, the safe use of the garage could each play a mitigating role. Um, and I am pleased obviously to hear this afternoon that these have been referenced today by officers. Um, another suggestion may be a Copenhagen style um, uh, treatment on the five metre stretch could be beneficial. The surface could remain level, but vehicle paths and pavement could be indicated with markings or different road um, uh, or different block paving. Um, this again will be for the um, individual landowners to discuss. Um, so to wrap up and taking all planning considerations on balance, I am minded to initially move approval of the application with the inclusion of um, conditions requiring measures to be investigated in, and implemented in order to mitigate issues at the narrow access way, um, to work with officers to improve parking provision within the site, um, on the site plan, and to deliver a feasible plan for the footpath into the park. Um, just to finish, Chair, I remain open to the point of conclusion of fellow members in the coming um, few minutes. Um, thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Saunders. Councillor Peel. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Um, I think Councillor Saunders gave us a, uh, a pretty comprehensive tour through that uh, application. There isn't a huge amount to add other than being found guilty for repetition, but um, <clears throat> I'll just go back to what a, a member con uh, commented on in the first application we discussed uh, and the member concerned, I won't embarrass him by saying his name, said um, well I'm planning what we should do is follow the uh, the view of the ward councillor. Um, I, I disagree with that by the way, uh, the view of the ward councillor isn't always uh, influenced entirely by planning but my question I pose back is what if you have two ward councillors who present two differing points of view? Um, so obviously that is a, um, uh, a a piece of advice we shouldn't we shouldn't follow as a rule. Um, the, the the I mean it, it, when I first saw the application, I just thought it was very straightforward. <coughs> um, the only reason I, I, I saw that it was coming for committee was the number of objectors had reached the threshold. But it is a, a former industrial classic 
brownfield site, uh, an infill uh, within the uh, the urban area, and it's exactly these types of sites that uh, the council has, has identified in its allocation plan in order to protect greenfield sites uh, around Farnworth and elsewhere. Um, if these types of sites were not developed, <coughs> we would lose significant pieces of, of valuable immunity land, which is there for everybody to use. And inevitably, these types of sites do have contamination issues. Some of them have access constraint issues just because of the, the history and the nature of the site. Um, uh, but I am persuaded by the argument uh, given by the applicant and, and expressing the report that at the end of the day, this does already have a stamp permission for industrial use. Um, so if it wasn't turned into a housing, a small housing site, which I'm sure, um, notwithstanding some, some issues, I'm sure the neighbours prefer that any day over an industrial site. But if, if this didn't happen, then people do need to realise that it can um, reopen uh, as an industrial site for a whole range of activities, including a scrapyard. Uh, and I am convinced that <clears throat> because of that, the problem that the uh, objector is experiencing with access is at best no worse uh, than, than the problem that existed when it was last in use. Um, there is an argument, I'm not convinced it, it's proven, but there is an argument that um, um, if it reopened as industrial, there would be even more trips generated. I'm not, I don't know about that. <coughs> But it would definitely involve heavier, heavier goods vehicles. I think that I think that's pretty, uh, pretty obvious uh, and commercial vehicles. So for all those reasons, I'm very happy uh, to throw my support behind uh, Councillor Saunders in his um, enthusiastic moving of this application. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Uh, not very much to add, really. I think Councillor Saunders and Councillor Peel have covered uh, most of the issues. It's a brownfield site. The housing has got to be better than the uh, the industrial use that it was put to previously. Uh, it's convenient for Farnworth Town Centre, so sustainability shouldn't be an issue. I'm sure in the not too distant future, if it's approved, the little bit of grass on the front of the houses will be paved over to improve parking. So the only real issue for me is the uh, the objector's uh, uh, issue with egress from her garage. And I'm um, encouraged by the applicant's uh, willingness when I asked him in questions, his willingness to try and accommodate that by the use of mirrors or perhaps road markings or some of the suggestions that Councillor Saunders has put forward. I'd perhaps like to see that conditioned that the applicant will work with the residents and in particular Mrs Rayner to uh, to ease that problem. But apart from that, happy to uh, support the application. Thanks, Chair. Will be clear, Councillor Allen, you were suggesting that that should be included the condition. Is that correct? Yes, Chair. Yeah. Councillor Sanders, would you be happy to accept that uh, as an additional condition? On your original proposition? Yeah, certainly, Chair. Um, so, just to wrap up where I um, had finished off, um, um, so approving the application with the conditions um, attached to mitigate issues at the narrow access way, um, to work with officers to improve parking provision on the um, site plan, and to deliver a feasible plan for the footpath into the park. Thank you. Thanks, Sanders. Officers want to comment on that, uh, including those as conditions. Ms. Turton. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so yes, the three the three conditions that I think um, have been stated were to um, improve the to condition the footpath link through to the park and to um, ensure we have details of that to ensure that the width um, and the boundary treatments are acceptable 
Um, secondly, to condition improvements to the access arrangements and visibility from the garage, um, possibly with the use of mirrors and um, signage or reduced speed into and out, and out of the site. So I think they're all very reasonable and things that we, we will definitely put as condition if, if the application is recommended for approval. Thank you, Chair. Um, members have heard it was well, seconded that uh, the application would be approved with those uh, additional points to be included as conditions. Mrs Ridge, can we take the vote please? Members will be voting for approval or against approval. Thank you, Chair. So, Councillor Allen? For. Councillor Ayub? For. Councillor Connor? For. Councillor Darvish? For. Councillor Dean? For. Councillor Hayes? For. Councillor Hornby? For. Councillor Mistra? For. Councillor Morris? For. Councillor Newall? For. Councillor Peel? For. Councillor Radcliffe? For. Councillor Sanders? For. Councillor Sherrington? For. Councillor Walsh? For. Councillor Waters? Councillor Waters? No. Councillor Wright? For. Then that application is approved subject to the conditions. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Wright. Thank you, members. Carried. We come then down to the last application on the uh, bundle this afternoon, and that is uh, at page 51, numbers 3133 Ashton Street, uh, Bolton, retention of uh, structures already built. Um, Mr. Allen, I think you are addressing this one. Chair, can I just ring the um, supporter, please? To get I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. I think carried away. Chair, just to confirm, I have admitted the supporter, Mr. Patel. Uh, I just checked to tell you from here what is being said. Mr. Patel, I know. 
Just, I'll just check in that you can hear what is being said. Just, just about. It's, 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 a, it's a little bit faint. Right. We'll, we'll come to you in a few minutes. The process will be that uh, the officers will present the report. Um, I will then invite you to speak for three minutes and to take any questions that uh, members may have. Uh, and then we will open the debate. <coughs> Before we come to that one, uh, can I just clarify, uh, Councillor Waters, who wasn't able to vote in the last uh, item, has uh, sent a message that uh, she was offline but wished to vote against that application. Yeah, Chair, I've received that, but unfortunately, because we're a live meeting, um, I can't take that that vote, okay. which wouldn't have made There's any sense. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you in that case. Okay, thank you. Mr. Allen, please, if you could uh, that report, please. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, just to clarify for members' uh, information really at the start, um, pages 60, 62 of the, of the, on the officer's report show the current proposal, uh, which is obviously for members to determine today. Uh, pages 63 to 67 are the appeal ref appeal decision from the planning inspectorate reference within the report and also pages 68 to 69 are 69 are the previously refused schemes so you can see hopefully the difference between um, what the appeal decision was based on in terms of the previous refused scheme and the current proposal uh, also just like to draw members attention to the um, photos of the site. Um, the first three or four are of, of the um, the rear of the site and the extent you can see there is 31, I think it's 31, uh, as built. Um, and 33 is obviously the, the, the one to the left of the site. And just like to draw members attention to the, um, I suppose, character, character of the area. Um, it's obviously seven, two semi-detached properties uh, in a very prominent location, uh, which is quite obviously quite open on the, a number of uh, key roads in the area. Thank you. Uh, so in, in summary then, in terms of the application, Councillor Abdullah has requested that the application is brought uh, for determination at committee. Uh, the reasons are set out on page 58 of the officer report. The rear and side extensions which have been built which you can see at 31 Ashton Street. Uh, have some, some of that has been done without the benefit of plan permission. Uh, I, it's not been in accordance with the previous planning approval. Uh, the council did serve an enforcement notice on the owner occupier of 31 Ashton Street to demolish the unauthorized extension. They subsequently submitted a plan application uh, with number 33 um, to uh, um, retain those elements that didn't have permission. The applicant has now, that, sorry, that was subsequently refused by officers and dismissed as appeal. The applicant has now submitted amended plans and seeks permission for the following. At 31 Ashton Street, a single storey and part two storey rear extension, a single storey side extension, uh, and along with an additional two metre long single storey extension along the party boundary with 33. Number 33 Ashton Street is now applying for the part two part single storey rear extension and a rear dormer as previously approved in 2016, along with a two additional two metre long single storey extension along the party boundary with number 31. Officers do not consider that the amendments before you today have sufficiently addressed the planning inspector's reason for dismissing the previous appeal and the proposed extensions would still harm the character and appearance of the host dwellings and the surrounding area. This would result in an unacceptable amount of outdoor amenity space for the residents at number 33 Ashton Street and the single storey extension side extension at number 33 would unduly harm the outlook of the residents at 29 Ashton Street. Members are therefore recommended to refuse this application. Thank you Chair. Can I now invite uh, Mr. Patel, the uh, uh, supporter, to address the meeting? We've got three minutes to speak and then to take any questions that members may have, uh, Mr. Patel. No problem. Thank you. Um, I, I, I'd just like to start by saying that I understand, obviously, a, a part of my extension was built without proper planning. 
um, from from the council. And um, believe me when I say that, I, I truly wish that I could turn back time and not bother with it at all. With the amount of time, the money, and the stress that it's all brought on. Obviously, it's been prolonged for a long period of time now. I've been off sick with depression and anxiety for the last, last six months as well, with all, with, all, with all this hanging over me. Having said all that, I've been trying to come to an amicable conclusion uh, with the council as well by offering to take down um, four and a half metres of the real single storey extension to the rear of the property. Uh, but, you know, just hearing um, the, the, the plan of speech just then, they've got an issue with the side extension also uh, to the grounds. Um, the, the, they're finding that it doesn't fit well with the overall look of the street or the area, that it's overdevelopment encroaching into my garden or outdoor space in terms of amenity space, and C, it's overbearing on, on, on the neighbours at number 29. Um, I, I don't know, I'm not too sure if they've still got an issue with, with, with the last one in terms of the overbearing with the neighbours because uh, we've clarified that it doesn't infringe on a 45 degree rule. Um, and as, as well as the fact that it's set back from the boundary wall, uh, as, as well as having handed in a signed statement from the neighbours to confirm that they've not got an issue with it and it's not infringing on their um, on, on, on their window space because it's not a principal window that is facing at the back anyway. It's a kitchen window and, and on top of that, there's, there's, there's a fence between the two houses now which they can hardly see the extension at all. In terms of the overdevelopment encroaching into my garden or, uh, or outdoor space, into my amenity space, the council guidelines state that for a semi-detached or detached property as mine is, it quotes as a rule of thumb, 50 square metres is considered to be the amount minimum for this style of property. Reduction to below this level is likely to constitute overdevelopment of the site, unquote. As, as it stands at this moment in time, I've been reading the, I've been reading the notes, and it says something like, I've got 20 square metres, but we've had it double and triple checked. At this moment, as it stands, we've got over 50 square metres of amenity space, which is being used by the kids. So they, they cycle around the house. We can bring bins along the side of the house and, and play in the front and the back of the yard. Uh, with, the, with the proposed um, taking down the four and a half metres from the rear of the property, that will bring it up to 66 square metres of outdoor space. So I, I don't know how much more they want me, out, outdoor space that they want me to have. Um, because uh, around this area, I don't think you'll find anyone that's got around anywhere near the 66 square metres that we'll have once we've taken down the rear, extent, uh, the, uh, part of the rear uh, extension. In terms of it not fitting well with the overall look of the area, um, I, I don't see how knocking down the side of the, 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 the back end of the rear side extension changes the view from the street. I, I did send in some pictures, but Vicky mentioned that I, I wouldn't be able to show them whilst I'm talking. But from the front of the property, the, the, the property will still look the same because the side extension starts on the original property before the extension. So that's part of permitted development. The, the bit that will have to be knocked down will be the back of the property. Um, the, the side extension starts um, further into the property, about four metres into the property as well, four or five metres into the property so that, you know, it doesn't um, interfere with the look of the street, etc. And um, in, in terms of the back, how it looks from the back street, no one, it's a cobbled back street, not even the bin men go in there. They, 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 they park the, the, the bin van outside and pull the bins out. Um, on, on top of that, I, I did send in a plans for 25 Morrison Street with a friend of mine that I was advising. Um, his property is very similar to mine in terms of that it's a semi-detached, but he's got a bit less space. Um, he wanted a two-story wraparound extension approved, um, but he, he, had it, he had it approved all, all the way to his boundary wall that I was convinced was going to get rejected as, as I've had so much trouble with my little one, one okay. and a half metre side extension. Thank you. You've had your three minutes, uh, Mr. Oh, sorry. Oh, thank sorry. you. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, sorry, I do. I, I'm sorry for baffling on a little bit. OK, thank you. A question uh, from Councillor Hayes. Can you tell me, did you have this uh, designed and built by an architect and builder, or did you do it yourself? So uh, how, it, how it was, uh, so the initial planning was done by an architect in terms of how it was going to be built, etc. And that was what was that was what was submitted to the council. Um, but when 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 we started the work on it, the work turned out to be extensive. So what happened was at the back of my property when 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 they built 
all the houses on my street, um, what they did was the, the tar that they fill in the cobbles with at the back, on the back street, they had, apparently they had a tank of that and on mine and number 33's backyard. So when they started digging, it, it turned out to be a massive job because they couldn't find the, the, the soil where they can actually start building on. And uh, like I said, that brought in a year's delay. And I think there was a lot of miscommunication between the builders and myself. And, and at, at the end, I think a, a lot of it was done with my father because I was off sick at the time as well. And there was a lot of miscommunication. And that's the reason why it ended up the way it has. And, and like I said at the beginning of my statement, if, if I could turn it all back around and have it exactly the way I wanted, I, I'd do that in a heartbeat because it's been so stressful and the amount of money and time. And obviously you guys can appreciate that yourself. But um, yeah, if I could, I'd, I'd turn it all back. Did you not think, or your father not think, that possibly talking to the planning department about the changes might have been a fairly good idea? I think what happened was, um, was that the, the, the builder said, look, you've spent all this money into the ground, taking all this money out. Uh, what I, the exact words they used to my father was, take it up to the end wall and we'll, we'll be able to, you know, the side extension we didn't think was, was an issue until I didn't think that was an issue until I was just reading all the notes, to be honest with you, because I thought that was part of the permitted development. Obviously, I can understand that the rear bit of it wasn't, and I can understand that now. But in terms of the back bit and what we've agreed to knock down, um, it, it, I think it was off it was off the cuff kind of decision. And I, I can appreciate where you're coming from now. Obviously, with hindsight, I, I, I can appreciate that. OK, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hornby. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Yeah, it's similar to uh, Councillor Hayes, my question. Um, purely, you had, um, it was signed off with the foundations and everything by some building inspector. Uh, is that is that the case or, or was it not? So there was complications after, so once it was signed off, um, the, the, there was complications because of what we found in the ground. So we had to get the council out again in terms of, um, because I think they found chemicals in the ground and because they basically just dumped all, all the chemicals at the end of the day, in, they made a big well and just dumped all the chemicals in there so that it was smelling of diesel and stuff as well when we, when we, when we were pulling out soil just to dig out the foundations. Uh, but, but yeah, we, we, did have, we, did, we, we did have it all approved, etc., by by planning authorities before, before the work started, yeah, if that was the no, question. No, no, the point I'm making is what you had permission for is not what you actually built. You, you, you've you gone way above what you had uh, permission to do. A building build uh, inspector must have signed that off to, to say that your foundations and everything were right. Is, is that the case or is that not the case? I'm, I'm not too sure. Like I said, it was two, I it's two and a half years ago now or something. I, I'm, I'm not, it, the, the work started even before then. So, um, I, 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 I don't recall exactly. Thank you, Mr. Patel. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Sorry about that. Thank you, uh, Mr. Patel. We now move to questions to officers. Uh, Councillor Hayes. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, really, about the the expiry of the of the appeal time by about a month and the decision of the officers to allow a further application to be made. I'd like to know, is that normal practice? Uh, was a fee charged for that? And were there any costs to the council as a result of that? Was that a question to myself or? No, that, that's to the officers. Thank you. Your presentation is finished, Mr. Patel. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Allen, please. All right. Apologies. Apologies, Councillor. Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's well, it's currently it's, it's not current practice now to, to do um, perhaps what we did three, three years, three years ago now. Um, if we got if we served an enforcement notice, um it's it's 
better practices for the appellants to actually appeal the enforcement notice rather than submit a plan application, another further plan application, and, and it's 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 not not certainly our working practice now. Uh, but I suppose we we are where we are. I'm not in terms of the fee for the subsequent applications. If the normal practice is, I think it is, if it's if an application is refused, and then it's resubmitted within six months, it can be as a free go. Um, so I, I I don't have the details in front of me in terms of whether an additional your planning fee was was charged uh, for the subsequent application. Um, but if, if I suppose it, it, if if it well, I can the the current application will have will will have been a um, a new a new fee. I can confirm that. Um, it's just whether the 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 second application on the site was um, or sites was a um, was a fee. I, I can't answer that. I'm afraid. I think I remember paying that the second time as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Purcell. You can't participate now in the discussion. Um, oh. uh, Councillor Darvash, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I think Councillor Hayes asked a very reasonable question there in terms of the enforcement notice. The reality is the enforcement notice, um, the timelines do actually disappear most of the time and applicants are able to put in applications at any time. As long as, this, as, long as they seem to be doing something, then they're allowed to put the application in. Most of the enforcement notices, deadlines actually get ignored. That's my experience anyway. Um, the question I've got is on paragraph 44 and it's this legal agreement that um, the um, our legal department are considering which is to ensure that the extensions at number 33 and number 31 are commenced um, at an agreed time frame commenced at the same time now you know I, i've dealt with a number of uh, joint applications in crompton terrace houses coming up with plans to build together it's something that our um, SBD actually encourages I've never come across any type of legal agreement which forces them to do it at the same time. And I don't think we can even enforce something like that because when an application is approved, it's allowed to, it's allowed there for three years. Now, one applicant might decide to start before the other and there could be all sorts of complications. So I, I, don't, I really cannot understand where this legal agreement is coming from and whether we can actually enforce it. Mr. Allen. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Yeah, I mean, we can't, we can enforce it. It's, it's a relative, relatively new um, um, issue or an issue, but um, requirement that we have actually that is is essential because as I as I outlined in the report, in in effect, if number thirty three, sorry, thirty one, left. You know, got, got, they both got approval. Number 31 left their extension as is, and number 33 never built theirs out. Then, obviously, the, the scale of that extension clearly has a detrimental impact on the, the adjoining property. Um, so, it, it's paramount that the council do have control over uh, that both 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 are developed in tandem or extended in tandem. Uh, so yeah, it, to answer your question, yes, it, it is required, and yes, we we can enforce that legally because it would be a, it, it would be a uh, a legal agreement. So we we would have the power to enforce that. Thank you, Michelle. Councillor Allen. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, question really for the sake of clarity. Um, once we grant approval to any planning application, particularly a domestic one, um, <clears throat> people need to realise that we do not have any further contact with that site, any formal contact, uh, forever, uh, until perhaps there's a, an enforcement issue. We do not go around and check that it's being built as per the plans. Um, building control inspectors who may or may not be working for the council because of course private contractors are allowed now, do not measure the site. We've come across this many times on similar uh, applications. Planning inspectors do not measure the foundations to check that it's being built as per, as per approval. I wonder if uh, uh, Mr. Allen can perhaps just confirm that. Thank you. Mr. Allen. 
That, that's correct, Councillor. Uh, Bill and Control Surveyors will, will not go out and measure, um, you know, that it compl it's compliant with the approved planning 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 plans. Um, but members will be aware that we do have a monitoring officer now in our in our enforcement team. So, for example, it's perhaps more major development that we do monitor on a regular basis. But you know, if there's a problematic site or where we've perhaps served in enforcement notice before, um, we we will. That, that will be part of our monitoring regime that we will take a more proactive approach at uh, checking sites. Thank you, Mr. Allen. We come then to debate. Uh, Councillor Hayes. Sorry about that, Chair. I couldn't get my camera on. Um, very sorry to hear that Mr Patel was ill as a result of this with stress. I hope he's now recovered. Um, very sad that that happened. Um, we have had a plethora of planning applications in recent years which seem to regard planning approvals as merely a suggestion of what they might like to build. And I notice that when we have errors in these uh, planning applications, and invariably bigger than the approval, and very rarely are they smaller than the approval. Now, this actually, I think, would cause a lot of damage, even the amended version, on the future residents of number 33. It's very often that existing residents are persuaded to say that they don't have a problem with a particular application, but we should go beyond that we should look at the potential future applicants and the impact it would have on them. I think the officers have handled this very reasonably. I think that they've given plenty of time to appeal, as, as I dealt in my question with the officers, and I would like to move refusal. Thank you, Councillor Hayes. Uh, Councillor Waters. Sorry, I was... Um, I uh, completely agree with everything um, Councillor Hayes um, has said and not only that um, we know that there has been over the, the last nine years that I've been on the council anyway and probably before then a lot of retrospective funding applications and people building what they want to build rather than uh, what they have permission for. Um, one of the other things that we've also talked about in the past is um, not necessarily being the police of the planning planning committee world, but would we, if this planning application was presented to us today, had it not been carried out, would we give it approval? And I have to say the answer would be no. Uh, the answer would be to, to refuse. So for that reason um, and the other reasons that uh, Councillor Hayes has, has commented on, I would second refusal. Thank you, Councillor Waters. I have no more speakers uh, registered. Therefore, uh, it has been proposed and seconded uh, that the application be refused. Members, therefore, are voting for refusal or against refusal. This is Rich. Can we take the vote, please? Thank you, Councillor Walsh. Councillor Allen? For. Councillor Ayob? For. Councillor Connor? For. Councillor Darvish? For. Councillor Dean? For. Councillor Hayes? For. Councillor Hornby? For. Councillor Mistry? For. Councillor Morris? For. Councillor Peel. Sorry, Councillor Newall. For. Councillor Peel. For. Councillor Radcliffe. For. Councillor Sanders. For. Councillor Sherrington. For. Councillor Walsh. For. Councillor Waters. For. Councillor Wright. For. The application is refused. The application is refused. Thank you very much indeed. Those are all the applications. We have to note at the back of the uh, bundle the uh, planning appeals notices. 
received and determined. Any comments? Councillor Allen. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just a comment really, just to say that I'm extremely disappointed with the planning inspector's decision on land south of Dentsdale Close. That's the first one on the list. Uh, myself and ward colleagues objected to that because of the buildability really, because this site is down in the depths uh, in an area which forms part of the wildlife corridor. So I am disappointed and I rather suspect it will not uh, not get built on anyway. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Allen. As Councillor Allen is disappointed, I'm delighted at the second one on the land north of Templecombe Drive and uh, south of Longworth Road Lane, which was uh, refused by committee uh, delegated powers and dismissed by the inspector. And as a ward council, I'm delighted about that. But that being the whole of business, can I thank members for your attendance? Declare the meeting closed. Mm -hmm.